Hello and welcome on behalf of MIT, the engine and myself to this webinar on MIT's response to COVID-19. MIT is at the tip of the spear in an effort where science and technology are paramount. And today we will hear from the people behind that innovation. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to our moderator, Nicholas Thompson, Editor-in-Chief of Wired, to take it from here. Nicholas, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, James. It's very kind of you to put this together, to invite all of us and to get this conversation going. It should be an absolutely extraordinary one. At the very beginning, I just want to say to everybody, we're going to try to make this an interactive conversation. I'm going to be asking everybody questions, but if you have questions, put them in the Q&A. Just mark them. I'll look at them as we go. I'll ask questions in the flow as appropriate. At the end, we'll block off 10 to 15 minutes specifically for questions from everybody in the audience. But again, we want this to be a conversation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce our four amazing panelists. They're each going to talk through a little bit about what they're doing now. They're then going to talk a little bit about where we stand in the pandemic, where it's headed, how we can be better prepared to do a better job in the future. So without further ado, our four panelists in alphabetical orders, we have Jim Collins, He's a professor of bioengineering at MIT, the founder of Sherlock Biosciences, which recently received emergency use authorization from the FDA for CRISPR SARS COVID-2 kit used to detect COVID-19. We have Mariana Matis. She is the co-founder and CEO of BioBot Analytics. She will explain, but it is absolutely extraordinary. We have Fiona Murray. She is the Associate Dean for Innovation at the MIT, School, MIT Sloan School of Management co-director of the MIT Innovation Initiative, currently stewarding MIT's institute-wide COVID-19 community. And we have Katie Ray, the CEO of The Engine, which as most of you know, is a venture capital fund built by MIT in 2016 that aims to solve the world's biggest problems through breakthrough technologies. So four extraordinary people working on this problem in extraordinary ways. But let's begin by everybody just going through and saying some of what they're doing right now. Start it with Jim. Jim, you're doing a million things. Give us a little overview. Yeah, Nicholas, thanks. So our lab at MIT and the Beast Institute is largely focused in working on projects in synthetic biology and antibiotic. We, like so many labs in the Boston area and around the country, have pivoted effectively all of our efforts to COVID-19 related projects. And we are working on using synthetic biology and our deep learning for vaccine development, therapeutic development, and diagnostics. Maybe I'll just highlight the last area. As you shared, I'm involved with Sherlock Biosciences, both as co-founder and director. I'm very happy that the company really did heroic efforts to get a CRISPR-based diagnostic for SARS-CoV-2 through FDA approval and are now looking to finalize a major manufacturing partnership that could produce up to a million of such tests. And these are laboratory-based tests that would be in a CLIA lab. Within our lab, we're now building on our related efforts on CRISPR-based diagnostics and synthetic biology diagnostics in two key ways. One is we're really looking to advance now at home testing. One is actually embodying the CRISPR based technology and the synthetic biology technology in a face mask that could give you a fluorometric readout in about an hour or two after wearing the mask. And now we're basically pivoting the same technology towards developing an at home saliva test, so a system that could potentially give you an output in just an hour without need for any fancy equipment. So I put on my mask. If I'm positive, it turns a separate color based on the technology you built into it? So you put on the mask and, uh, you know, you wear it, you know, from breathing, talking, coughing, sneezing, you're giving off a good amount of viral particles if you're infected. And the mask would detect the presence of the viral particles. And we wouldn't have a changed color. We don't want somebody walking around with a scarlet letter. Uh, that would end up for or social ostracization, but it would produce a fluorometric signal that you couldn't see by eye, but you could detect with an inexpensive handheld fluorimeter that might cost, for example, a buck. Wow. Um, all right, Mariana, do you want to go through what you are doing right now? Yes. Um, Biobot started as a, as a research project at MIT and is a wastewater epidemiology startup. So it means that we look at wastewater as, as our collective uh, sample and we analyze for molecules in the wastewater to understand what's happening in the population. Um, before COVID-19, our company was focused on tackling the opioid epidemic, which was considered the 
number one public health issue in the country, producing data on the consumption of different types of opioids at the neighborhood level, and using that data to create the right programs, the right education for the right communities. Then, you know, COVID-19 happened. As a public health company, we refocused all of our efforts towards measuring the novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater as a novel metric of what's happening in our communities, basically how many people are infected in a community um, based on the wastewater. And that work has very has uh, become very, very popular uh, beyond any expectations. Right now, the company grew from having about uh, about 10 customers to growing over 400 customers in just a couple months. And then, you know, having many more times that number in the waiting list. So at, at the moment, basically the company is growing through, growing and just going through this like exponential growth phase to try to bring our technology to scale in, in the country. I should say that I um, have been living in a small town in the Catskills and I uh, wrote to our city council to get put on your waiting list. But explain a little bit about exactly how it works. So you take a sample from a wastewater facility, you then measure the presence of bacteria that you know match COVID-19, and then you're able to tell the community, oh, you have a prevalence of X, whereas yesterday you had a prevalence of Y, it's increasing or it's decreasing. What, what, exact, what data exactly are you pulling from the wastewater? Yeah, we can we can find the concentration of the of the novel coronavirus by looking at the genetic signature of the virus through a technique called qPCR. It's a very commonly used technique, and the wastewater treatment plants collect the samples according to our protocols, send them to our laboratory in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and then we measure the concentration in the lab of the virus, and then we use that number to model to estimate approximately how many people are infected in that area. And, you know, some preliminary findings there um, are clearly showing that the data from the wastewater indeed um, is different from what we see in the clinic because it includes everybody who is infected, uh, including the asymptomatic populations, people with mild symptoms, people who may not have access to, to healthcare and therefore are not tested so um, going forward, we see this as a service where we can provide the data on a daily or weekly basis, and then be a thermometer for the community where our leaders can know the effect of their decisions on the level of infection in the community in a very real-time fashion. Absolutely extraordinary. All right, Fiona, you've got a thousand projects that you're connected to, but tell, uh, tell us about some of the most important and interesting ones right now. Of course. So the MIT Innovation Initiative was basically founded to try to connect MIT's community of innovators, both on campus, across the different schools, across the different educational programs, and between faculty, staff, and students, and then to connect them out into the innovation ecosystem in Boston and out into the world. Uh, when COVID started, our first hypothesis was that we really needed to sort of start with some of the things that we do best on campus, which is things like hackathons and solving problems as ways for students in particular to get involved in the crisis. Uh, we soon realized that they were actually already doing that without any help. And so we actually shifted our activities and recognized that the really important value that we could add was to actually try to reduce some of the frictions in the system. Because what was happening is that there were lots of small hackathons going on, lots of different people focused on campus on um, personal protective equipment, lots of different people thinking about how to use the various maker spaces, how to contribute to ventilator projects. And so we created this rapid innovation dashboard as a way in which we could help with the matchmaking of individuals with particular skills and talent, some of the resources that were available on campus, and some of the particular needs and projects. And so that platform has really helped us support hundreds of projects that are going on, particularly the student-oriented projects, uh, and also helps us link students into some of the really interesting startups that um, you've already heard about and some of the others, so that as they start to think about how they can really make a contribution, particularly over the summer, uh, now that uh, graduation has happened, we can really start to make sure that the, the talent, the resources, the expertise is all really brought together in the most effective way possible. 
I, I don't want to ask you which of your children you love the most, but tell me about <laughs> one of the projects or two of the projects that particularly excites you that is uh, moving forward right now. I mean, there are a couple of projects that I think are incredibly interesting. So uh, quite a lot of that, particularly the work around the School of Management, is focused on analytics. And so there's a very large team of um, students led by faculty member Professor Dimitri Bertsimas really focusing on how you can think about bringing some of the cutting edge analytics tools to things like um, occupancy rates in um, ICU and what have you. And basically to do that, not just in Boston, but leverage out the extraordinary network of physicians who we've trained in management over the years so that all of those tools and methods are being used to optimize the ways in which hospitals are being run um, in Massachusetts and Connecticut. A lot of that has then been brought over to the UK because of some of my connections. Uh, and so I really do think it is a lot in this use of data, um, both data mm -hmm. based on the sorts of things that Jim and Mariana talked about, but also data uh, that is more the kinds of things that you'd use with supply chains, um, you know, managing the physical assets that we really need to bring to bear very, very efficiently. So I'm excited for how I think in the long run that's also going to make a really big difference in how we run our medical system. I certainly hope so. Um, Katie, you want to talk about some of the incredible things the uh, the engine is working on right now and some of the some of the, your partners and companies you work with? Of course. So the engine was set up to really look at what are the biggest problems that we're facing as a group and what are the innovations that are coming out of MIT and other sister institutions that could actually tackle those. So our orientation has always been long term. For these things, and so Mariana, of course, is is a is a uh, engine um, part of the engine, but she also has other companies that are working on uh, equally interesting things. So whether it's in rapid diagnostic testing, uh, there's a company called E25. They've been working up until we COVID hit on things like Zika and dengue, um, and chikungunya, which are tropical diseases that are devastating in different parts of the world to millions and millions of people already. In fact, billions of people. But can you, you know, tilt that technology for a rapid diagnostic test? So that's, that's an example of something. But also companies like Vaxis. So one of the big problems we have is that let's pray we get to a vaccine. How do we get the world's people that vaccine very quickly? a really difficult thing to do. And so this is a company that can do that with a cold chain. So they do not need, these don't need to be stored. They're literally a patch that goes on your arm, sits for five minutes, and you're vaccinated. You could do that in the comfort of your own home. And they've been shown to be much more effective way to, to deliver the vaccine. Um, you know, obviously early, but super important kind of line of research. And then there are also way, different ways of detecting. So Jim, Jim talked about one, but there's a company um, called C2 Sense in our portfolio that is working on a different way to detect um, COVID and, and other similar substances. These are streams of work that have been going on for, for decades in, in some instances at MIT. And now they kind of have their shining moment. So I think the role that we play is to back some of these companies with capital, but also to help them scale rapidly. Like if Mariana and I were joking before this, what time did you get up this morning? Because I'm sure you're having 18-hour days. So 4 a.m. Sure. Yeah. Because you know everybody needs what what many of these companies have in terms of technology to tackle this problem. But, you know, to scale these companies rapidly is really difficult. And that's what the engine tries to do is lend a hand and expertise in some of these areas to make it simpler to scale globally to tackle the problem. Wonderful. One quick technical question. Why is a patch better than an injection? Because you don't need a second person to do it. Cause it's easier to ship them to rural areas via drone. What's the advantage so, of a patch? Uh, yeah, there's a couple of things. One, you don't need a healthcare worker. You can do it mm -hmm. yourself. And number two, the hypothesis is because of the way it enters the body quite slowly, you have much higher uptake, so it's it's more effective. That's that's the simple hypothesis behind it. Great. 
All right, so that is what everybody is working on. You can see why this panel was put together because everybody is doing something awesome. So now let's talk a little bit about some of the gaps in where we are right now and what we need to do. So Jim, uh, Fiona was talking about data, talking about all the data we're collecting, better ways of sharing data, better way of managing data. You've spoken a little bit about some of our failures in using all of the data we have right now and in optimizing all the different work streams we have. Explain a little bit about what you mean by that and how you think we, we can improve it. You know, I think one of the challenges that I've seen throughout the pandemic is that we've largely been flying blind from a data standpoint in that we've not collected the kinds of data that we need from the beginning in terms of incidents, true incidence rate, current incidence rate, past incident rate. And we're currently not modeling and or analyzing those data, I think, at the level that is needed. I have worked in computational biology for over 30 years and appreciate the efforts by my colleagues doing epidemiology model, but they are flawed in that they have multiple free parameters, meaning you really can get whatever you want out of the model, depending upon the assumptions you put in regarding the parameters. And as such, they're not particularly valuable. When we've seen that uh, from the standpoint of wildly different predictions and being shoved in the face of different politicians as they adjust their predictions based on the models. I think we need to do a better job from a big data standpoint on analyzing the data as they come out, it, you know, largely because we're conducting the largest social experiment in human history with significant consequences, both from a public health standpoint and an economic standpoint. And I think more detailed, richer analyses are needed to make informed decisions. I've been struck by what's passing for science and what's passing for data, in most cases, just opinions. And certainly you can have expert opinions by experts, but that's not science. And I think we need to be able to expand our ability to quantitatively and rigorously analyze various data affecting uh, us via the pandemic. Wait, so we're not collecting the right data or we're not looking at the data that we've collected in the right ways, or we're listening to the wrong people who have analyzed the data in the wrong ways? So I think it's probably all of those above. Um, so for example, getting after the data, I, I, I was struck from the very beginning on the insistence from a diagnostic standpoint on only testing those with symptoms. It didn't make any sense to me that we should treat anybody who has a symptom as actually being infected. And if they need hospitalization, then run a test so that you can properly protect the healthcare workers. What we didn't do was actually test those without symptoms to get a sense of those currently infected but not exhibiting symptoms. And second, we didn't run and set up antibody tests from the very early to get a sense of and So we weren't collecting those data properly. Now that we have some of those data, we're not actually analyzing them properly to do rigorous analyses from a statistical standpoint of getting a sense of where are we, where are we going? Third, I, I think we're allowing a lot of folks to seize their moments of fame with their data and modeling without hearing from multiple voices. The idea that we elevate a singular voice in public health or modeling onto a mile high pedestal is absurd from a scientific standpoint. That's not what happens. Science is very much a human activity where we're battling each other on various analyses with their advantages, disadvantages, and in particular, our interpretations. And so I think we've seen a misrepresentation of what science is about and like by much of the media. Okay. Um, Fiona, let me ask you a little bit about a related area, which is digital contact tracing, which is a way of getting lots of data, right? A way of tracking who's infected, who's not infected, where they've been, who they've been near. And there's been this promise through much of the world that you'd have it. And in fact, it is working in some countries, but it's nowhere as far as I can tell in the United States. And it seems like one of the problems is that we have about a million different apps that are not connected, different projects, including some at MIT. How do we how do we make this work? How do we turn digital contact tracing into something that provides useful data that helps us model a response? I mean, I think what we often see when we're at the beginning stages of people identifying a really new problem. So this is a new problem area. We've never actually really had to think about contact tracing in any very significant way before. It's very classic when industries like this and problems emerge to actually see a whole plethora of solutions coming to the fore. And in some ways, we really want that because this whole range of solutions actually gives us things that are optimized on different dimensions. I think the problem that we have right now is that we don't have the luxury that we might normally have 
of running some of the sort of business experiments to see which characteristics work best and so on. And so we basically have a challenge where we, we are letting a thousand flowers bloom, but what that's doing is giving us these problems of interoperability, of data sharing. We also don't really, we haven't had, I think, the hard conversations that we need to have at the intersection of public health, privacy, and sort of national security. And so that sort of set of conversations, which, you know, were happening very, very slowly with lots of different sort of tensions, really without the health piece being added in, I think suddenly are having to fast forward very, very rapidly. Um, and so you're seeing both different responses within the United States. I'm also seeing different responses in the United Kingdom where, you know, the Brits have one version, they've decided to develop their own app and so on. Um, and so I think what we need to do is start to really think about, you know, what are the solutions that we need to put into place in the short term, which in some ways are really a band-aid because I don't think we can have the sort of negotiation and really put into place some of the sort of security pieces and this tension between openness and, and privacy. Um, but we are going to have to find some very rapid data standards so that we can actually share this information. And we may need to ask people to use these kinds of apps in the short run, you know, for the next six months while we actually sort this out and understand what to do and then think about how we might shift to some more uh, robust long-term solutions. But I think in some ways that, that's very unsatisfactory, but I can't actually see you know, the US or any other place, we don't normally see people tilting to a particular standard this quickly, even though it might be, you know, socially optimal to do so. No, I actually, I actually find your answer very satisfactory because if I heard it correctly, what you're saying is there is a huge debate about safety and privacy, totally agree, but that your position is that we should plunge ahead and everybody should start using these apps while we have that debate instead of having the debate and then getting them later. Is that a correct reading of your response? Yeah, I think in the interests of public health, we're going to have to do that. But what I would argue for is actually us doing something like that for a short period. Um, and, you know, we could decide how long that needs to be. I'd say it was something that we'd have to commit to doing for six months and then 12 months once, you know, as the vaccine is being developed. And we'd need to put into place, I think, some commitment to actually then effectively delete the data so that we can then do that in the short run because of um, health security concerns. And while we're doing that, we have to run the privacy and security debate in parallel. Okay. Um, Mariana, let me ask you a little bit about um, your data and what you collect. So as you've been collecting from wastewater and from cities and from towns and municipalities, and you've been giving them back information, are you also then giving them advice on what to do? Are you just giving them numbers or are you giving them numbers plus advice? And are you tracking how their numbers change as they carry out policy options, right? So is there a locality that says, well, we went on a complete lockdown from X to Y, did our numbers change as a way of testing whether that policy was the right policy? Yeah, the, the main question that our customers have is, you know, what's happening in my community and how, how is the disease changing based on my policy decisions? Based on, you know, now people are allowed to go back to get haircuts, to go back to school, to go back to work. So um, that's where we've focused our data analysis and our service back to them, is to show them side by side how their wastewater data is trending compared to the policies that they have put in place. And we have one case study here for the state of Massachusetts where we have been sampling the most since we're local, where we clearly see the wastewater data becoming positive for COVID uh, in early March, in the same week as the first reported clinical cases um, were locked in the state, we begin seeing the detection in the wastewater. And then we see the level of the virus in the community going up exponentially over the next few weeks until we hit uh, late March, where Governor Baker issued the stay-at-home order and then we see the levels basically plat uh, reaching a stable level. They don't continue to go up. We reach a stable level of infection with a very slow decrease, which really shows that probably we need to think about mitigation for very long periods of time because the, the going up was very fast and then the going down is very slow. And now we're very curious to see what's going to be the impact on the level of infection since the state is reopening now in late May. 
And that's exactly the type of information that, that they want to have, a tool to know what's the impact of their decisions on the level of infection in the community. So the data from Massachusetts suggests that the level of the virus in the wastewater has been constant pretty much or a slight decline since late March, even though I believe the death rate has declined quite a bit. So fewer people are dying, but people are infected? Correct. But, um, but it seems that the level of the infection, you know, it's just going to take time for it to clear out from the community because it's uh, it, it leveled off and it's even going down slightly, but it was not a dramatic decrease after the shelter in place. And while it was a very dramatic increase in the beginning, once the, the infection took, took place in the community. Well, that's terrifying. <laughs> All right, um, let's keep talking about, let's, let's stay on, I don't know, let's stay on depressing news then a little bit. Um, Katie, let me ask you about um, something you've mentioned before. So obviously with coronavirus, there are a whole lot of new problems that are created, right? We have to learn how to test, we have to learn how to treat, we have to learn how to map. But as we've done this, we've created an additional set of problems, right? So you mentioned, for example, antibiotic resistance going up as we've perhaps treated excessively um, some of the patients who've come in. What are problems that, new problems that we've created with our response that we need to start dealing with now? I think I should. And by the way, with any of these questions, any of the other panelists who wants to jump in, please jump in. Anybody who has a follow-up question, please put it in the Q&A. I'm monitoring it. I'll get little alerts and I'll ask your questions. Okay. Sorry. Katie. I mean, listen, I'm going to defer antibiotic resistance to Jim since he is the world expert in that. But I'll just pepper in a couple things. I mean, of course, we have a massive public health crisis. We also have a mental health crisis with locking everybody at home, right? I mean, this... These things are are connected, um, but I think my point and what I've said earlier is that uh, there are things like this pandemic that we have been ignoring because they're long-term problems that are hard to face until they become a crisis. I would put antibiotic resistance in that category of things. I'll let Jim uh, talk about it in general because he he knows so much more. But, you know, I would put other crises there, too. Like, the world is heating up. People are losing their homes. That That is coming, too. So, um, you know, there's many, many things we want to ignore that we as a scientific and engineering community must tackle. And the urgency should be there for all of these things. I think COVID, in my mind, has activated us to understand how we can work this rapidly. And I think those lessons should be taken to these other, you know, really pandemic problems or endemic problems to the world. And so I think those are those are areas that I think we could address, but maybe we'll do that a little later in the conversation. But I think let's, Jim- let's, I 100% wanna do that. I, yeah. I love that line of thinking. We definitely need to get there. But first, let's freak out about antibiotic resistance. So, Jim, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll jump in. I'm, I'm not going to freak people out, but I'll make a couple comments. One is I've not seen evidence that the actions taken as part of the pandemic have significantly aggravated antibiotic resistance and that I don't see that the antibiotics are being overused or necessarily misused, albeit of maybe z coupled with hydroxychloroquine. But to, to Katie's point, I do think that the pandemic helped bring to light the challenges around antibiotic resistance. The antibiotic resistance is one of the existential threats facing humankind. And we are nearing a post-antibiotic era due to generally overuse of antibiotics, not in the context of the pandemic. It's an, it's an issue we need to address. In part, the economic market for antibiotics is broken. Pharma and biotech are getting out of it. And in fact, the issue is central to the current pandemic. One out of seven COVID-19 patients who are hospitalized have a bacterial co-infection. 50% of those who die have a bacterial co-infection. And the Spanish flu from 1918 that's gotten so much attention was largely so deadly because of bacterial co-infections. And to remind folks, that was in the pre-antibiotic age. That was before sulfur drugs were used and before penicillin. So can I just jump in there for one second? So I think the critical piece here is Pharma is getting out of antibiotics because they can't figure out how to make money on that. That is a critical societal problem. 
that instead of you know us joining together whether it's government philanthropy venture capital entrepreneurship all together to say hey we've got a real problem with this we often just ignore the problem and that's this has been the this is covid has brought that to light so to me antibiotic resistance is the problem but the solution has to be many different types of capital and human beings coming together to crack the code because it is just a puzzle the economics are a puzzle there that are holding us back right now but we should be able to overcome that and and i think jim is doing some incredible work there as well as many others and i think we need the level of intensity around that that we have for covid right now and yeah. Yeah, so that's coming. Yeah. Can uh, I just jump can I just jump in because and say, you know, I think if we think about the economic puzzles, AT has kind of highlighted what I think is one of the long term economic puzzles, which is how we focus our attention on these incredibly important sort of missions and challenges. I think we also have a short term economic puzzle on our hands, which is really how to construct support for the recovery. Because this is a recovery from something that is very different than many of the things that came before. So while the Spanish flu, I think, is an incredibly important example, it also came right in the wake of World War I, where we had an awful lot of actual destruction of sort of infrastructure in various places. So that was that recovery had to take a particular form. Uh, when we think about, again, the sort of post-World War II, um, you know, Marshall Plan kind of recovery again, you know, we had something very different. We had the U.S. economy still spinning and Europe sort of in, in um, a state of devastation. Um, so we don't really have anything quite like it. If you think about 2008, that was when our financial institutions had collapsed. And so I think there's a real economic puzzle here, and, and there is a looming crisis of how we actually construct the recovery, particularly, I think, for entrepreneurs, both the kind of tough tech um, entrepreneurs of the kind that you know MIT generates, um, that the engine funds, but also for SMEs and the small businesses. So we have to find ways of doing that and recognize that they need different solutions. Well, that's that's a great segue. So let's let's move to the sort of the next part I had in mind for this conversation, which is jumping ahead six months into the future, where ideally we're in a better spot than we are right now. And let me ask anybody on the panel, what are some of the businesses companies or industries where you think it'll be transformed for the better. A lot of people talk about online education. We're all thrown into it. Certainly my kids are doing it right now. We're going to learn a lot. Maybe it'll be better. A lot of people talk about telemedicine. We're thrown into that. It's going much better than it was three months ago. What are some of the other areas where you think that there will be, you know, plants coming up through the rubble? Well, I'll just jump in for one second, and, and I'm sure everybody else has their favorite. But, you know, I think it's it, it it's laid bare the fact that our supply chains are broken, right? Why couldn't we get PPE uh, in the amount that we needed? Um, or, or our drug supply chain. Most of our drugs are outsourced to China and India now, which is wonderful in one aspect, you know, for growing different economies and, and – but – the fact that uh, we have let that kind of fully go out of the U.S. is a real problem here for the future. So I think one of the things that will sprout out of this is kind of insourcing back so that we have some control over supply chain. Government plays a big role here, but so do entrepreneurs, right? And so uh, I think that's going to there are going to be many exciting things that get funded because people understand that over the long term, those businesses could be economic in different areas. And it's not just the US, the Europeans have the same trouble. Everyone has the same trouble with supply chain issues um, because of globalization. But we've got to learn to be more resilient there. And I think it'll be one of the tests of an entrepreneurial plan is, what does that bring and how do these economics work both in steady state and in disrupted times. So I'm looking forward to kind of working with entrepreneurs around that. Fascinating response. Does anybody else want to um, answer that question of the businesses that they think might be growing? 
I mean, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial communities in places outside of Boston. And what's been really interesting is actually looking at some of the responses and places like uh, the Middle East and the UAE, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, you know, engaging with both the government and entrepreneurs everywhere from Kigali to Lagos to Accra. What I think is quite transformative in those countries is actually a sort of a leapfrogging of some of the infrastructure and systems that we currently see in Europe and the United States, particularly health systems, for example. I think there's going to be a massive opportunity in all sorts of um, entrepreneurial health system activities. There's a huge uptick in the use of telemedicine. You already mentioned drones for delivery. We know about companies like Zipline, you know, that was uh, founded based out of Rwanda. Um, same with online education. So in the same way that I think we saw in uh, Kenya, a sort of a leapfrogging of traditional financial institutions to things like M-Pesa, I think we're going to see this in health, in education, and I suspect in sanitation as well. Um, I think that we're going to see this in some of the major infrastructure categories and probably in food, um, because I think food security is the other thing that has come to light. It's partly because of food supply chain, so it's also the production chain. And so my sense is, at least outside of the US, uh, we're going to see some very, very interesting opportunities there, as well as I agree with Katie, the distributed production opportunities and, and the need to really have a very different view of supply chains, I think will create some interesting near-term opportunities. Very, very interesting. Mariana, let me bring you back in here. What do you think that you'll be able to do in six months that you can't do now? Yeah, um, basically right now, based on research done by our team, research done by other researchers, I think somebody in the QA mentioned a paper from Yale University that just came out this week. Um, we're beginning to understand kind of how we can leverage the wastewater data to be more predictive about what's happening in a community in terms of the outbreak. So not just describe what's happened, but also what's going to happen. And there's growing evidence that the wastewater data gives you that early warning for what's going to happen over the next like seven days. You know, what's going to be the level of infection uh, with some level of prediction, which it's probably explained by uh, the fact that we're capturing people who are already shedding the virus and may not be displaying symptoms yet. Um, so there's like that predictive aspect to it. And what we imagine is giving that heads up, not only to government, but also to places of work, universities, tech companies, nursing homes, you know, the list goes on. And at BioBot, we have actually been receiving inbound from all, you know, big companies, tech companies, uh, all sorts of uh, places of work that want to have an early warning system for the re-emergence of the outbreak in their community. And I think that that's where we see our work going over the next six to 12 months, um, is to being more proactive about what's happening rather than descriptive. Well, that was a question from Paul uh, Mashikin that you answered. Let me ask you a question here from Anonymous. Somebody <laughs> hiding behind the Anonymous bar here. <laughs> Question from Ariana. I understand the virus likes to enter the body via epithelial cells and thus resides a lot in the gut, hence you find it in the wastewater. Could it be that it lives on there for a long time and therefore that's why you're not seeing the level go down? Yes, so uh, the average shedding time in stool uh, of residents in the gut is 22 days. So for sure, there's going to be some lag between the person feeling better and they becoming negative um, in in stool. So so there's some aspect of it of people like recovering and shedding virus for, for like 22 days um, in total. But I think that uh, it's also because again there's going to be a discrepancy between what we see in the clinic and what we see in the wastewater because we're capturing all of the people who are not showing clear symptoms of the disease. Uh, so I think that. Um, as we go forward, another area that we hope to nail down is um, being very accurate in our estimation of how many people are infected to contrast to the clinical cases and then give the feedback if that community has been very good at diagnosing, isolating, 
people who are infected or if there's a large gap, a large discrepancy between the two data sets that indicates there's a large asymptomatic population that it's going out and about without knowledge of infecting others. So it would, you would argue for more mitigation to be put in place. Great, okay. Let me ask you a question that anyone on the panel uh, can answer, but there's, you know, obviously over the last few years, there's been a lot of talk about artificial intelligence, a certain amount of fear about artificial intelligence, and then a big crisis came and artificial intelligence didn't save it from us. We just ran a wonderful piece in Wired by Kai Fu Lee, breaking down the areas where AI has been effective, partly in an early warning sign, partly in vaccine development. Some of the work that Moderna did was based on machine learning, but really AI hasn't saved us. And Kai Fu Lee, kind of a funny sentence, gives it a B minus during this crisis. So my question for all of you who are very expert in this, six months from now, as we develop better data sets, as the researchers working on machine learning have done more, as we've had more papers shared, do we think there will be a greater role for AI and where? And if no one wants to answer immediately, I'm going to call on Jim. <laughs> I so Nicholas, can you repeat the last 10 seconds of your question? It went, it went blank on my end. Sure. So six months from now, when there's been much more data collected, when we've been able to train machine learning models on this specific virus, when we figured out how to share the research being done in Wuhan with the research being done in Ohio, whether a will play a much bigger role than it has played up to date? Yeah, you know, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, I, I guess I would frame it maybe a little differently, and that is that it's not clear to me what a machine learning model could have done that it didn't do as part of this, and that I, I, think, I think people conflate machine learning models broadly with data analytics. And I think what we're lacking are really good data analytics, meaning looking to see, you know, can you, using various tools from including physics, what happened and can you understand the outcome or impact of schemes? Having said that, Nicholas, I do think that in six months is a very short time frame. Goodness. Um, I, I think we'll see machine learning approaches increasingly being used in drug discovery. So the development of needed antivirals, the development of needed antibiotics, the development of needed combination therapies, and that the value such platforms bring in those spaces is that they, once trained on suitable data sets, enable us to look at much larger chemical spaces, as well as designing de novo molecules and or combinations of molecules that could be very effective against a given condition, including a SARS-CoV-2 infection. Wonderful, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Let me ask you another question here from the audience. This is from Ellen Ellison and it's for Fiona. Do you think the leapfrogging in emerging market countries will be as great post-COVID with health, supply chain, food security, et cetera, as they have been in these countries uh, with the introduction of the mobile telephone? Right? So many people know mobile telephone came, it changed completely. Telephone infrastructure, you didn't have to deal with landlines. Move one step ahead. Could that happen with supply chains? I, I think we are going to see things that look like that. I'm, I'm not sure I think it's going to be as transformative because the mobile phone is basically a platform technology that has enabled all sorts of different things. Um, you know, the, the thing that will make the difference, I think, is a recognition um, that things like broadband are important. I know that many of these countries have thought about the fact that really having significant amounts of broadband is what is going to enable telemedicine, um, online education and so on. That being said, if we have that sort of infrastructure in place, I do actually think that we will see a huge leapfrogging in terms of online health. Uh, as I say, telemedicine, we're already seeing enormous shifts in very interesting companies uh, based out of Cairo, working all over um, the Middle East. I think in food, we've yet to see what exactly that sort of food security is going to look like, but quite a lot of thinking about the sort of food supply chain and what have you. So I think we need some more of the of the platform infrastructure. So the equivalent to the mobile phone, I would think about is much more about broadband. But that said, I do think it's going to be transformative. And I think entrepreneurs and their investors to come back to sort of, you know, the, the conversation that, that Katie started us with, are absolutely fundamental as change agents in these systems. So if you think about these as complex systems and we're trying to sort of poke at the points of leverage, I think we're going to see entrepreneurs and their risk capital providers being very activist and looking at opportunities um, at those points of leverage. Well, let's, yeah. uh, that very precisely leads into a question that I was going to ask for Katie. So let me just ask the question. I think Katie may want to jump in here. So this is from Nick, not from me, but from another Nick in the audience. 
Which areas can the private sector make the largest difference as far as investment capital? When thinking about making the biggest impact, how which areas should the private sector be thinking about to aid in response? It's That's a great and, of course, quite difficult uh, question to answer. And I think the private sector is, is you know, it, there are a bunch of different parts of the private sector. Um, but, you know, the, the areas we think after scanning, you know, all the top universities, MIT, very, very deeply, where people are trained to tackle the biggest problems. I mean, MIT's mission is impact. So the researchers there go after the really big, hard stuff, right? So we really see three big areas. One is, of course, reversal of climate change. Uh, two is how do humans last longer at a better at a better state? That's both how we feed and how we take care of our health care. And then the third is how do we get smarter and connect the world more tightly? So those are all the systems. But to me, I think the ones that are the most accessible to the private sector are things that extend human life and uh, things that reverse climate change. And we need substantially more investment there, and especially in these underserved areas. Like, as Jim would say, diagnostics. I mean, that has been so underserved uh, from the private sector. And by the way, people can make a lot of money in diagnostics if you get it right. Um, and also in these things that are called like gov tech, you know, the problem with government tech is that the, the sales cycles are slow. Well, let me tell you, a pandemic shifts that almost immediately, right? Um, then you can't serve enough people. Um, and so I think these are really interesting and underserved areas. And then, of course, anything that distributes, miniaturizes all the different supply chains have been have been really underserved. So that's energy, um, energy production, energy consumption, also food, et cetera. So like some of the areas we find super interesting are how do you expect extend the shelf life of food? Um, like we have a company, Cambridge Crops, that does that across all the different food supply chains, right? It's not just vegetables and fruit, it's fish and meat. I mean, if we are gonna produce meat, which has a huge carbon tax, at least it should last a long time. Um, and really get to market, right? And so we think about things like that. Um, and there's there's also incredible philanthropy going on, which should be tied to the private sector. So I think if you look at, you know, Gates or Schmidt's Fu Schmidt Futures or, um, you know, uh, Zuckerberg Chan Foundation, like they're all doing incredible work in these different areas. Um, and so, you know, encourage people to look at that. Uh, one plug for some of one of the things that we do, we do a lot of writing to kind of make these big global problems accessible because they are, the, the solutions are technical. So um, happy to make our publications available to anybody who would like them. Wonderful. Um, I want to stay with the framework of six months, a year from now down the line, and then I want to spend the last few minutes talking about predicting the next pandemic. But Jim, you work a lot on the most cutting edge science there is synthetic biology, CRISPR. Is there anything that you think we'll be doing six months from now that we're not able to do technologically right now, or that society is not ready to accept right now, but will be as we get deeper into this pandemic? Uh, you know, technology works pretty slowly. Um, so the easy answer would be, I don't see us anything uh, from a technological standpoint, but I'll, I'll share a concern related to your question. Right. There's, you know, concerns of, you know, will people allow certain things to go forward under stress and under conditions, and will they allow science they normally wouldn't be able to go through? I'm worried watching the enthusiasm and anxious enthusiasm around vaccine development that I'm worried that political pressures will be placed on our regulatory agencies to accept substandard clinical results and approved vaccines. And I hope that the public and the media picks up on this and begins to push back now before we get it approved when people accept stuff that is kind of questionable on data only to say we've got now a solution, we've got a vaccine, let's go. And 
I think we would waste a lot of resources. We would put more people at risk in doing so. And so that that's my big worry right now, looking out in your time frame, six to 12 months, where I hope we're going to have a number of, of vaccine candidates advancing decently through clinical trials. Wow, that's a fascinating concern I haven't heard before. All right, let's talk a little bit about how to predict the next pandemic and how to be better prepared. Clearly, we a lot of people have been talking about, you know, that transmitted coronaviruses, but we hadn't fully prepared. We didn't we don't do a great job of preparing for low probability, high impact events. How do we do a better job and how do we get ourselves ready for the next pandemic more than we were ready in January, February, March? Who wants to take a crack at that? And let me give one more reminder. If you're in the audience, fire your questions in the q and I've asked all the ones that are there. If you've got more questions, pop them in. We've got nine minutes. Let's go. I mean, maybe maybe I can start um, and just, you know, you mentioned how can we predict and then how can we react? One thing that I think is incredibly interesting about this pandemic is that it wasn't really a problem of prediction. I think there were many people who talked about the fact that this was a possibility, that this was very likely to happen. There were a whole lot of national governments who did sort of war games and scenarios that basically showed things that looked very, very similar. And the real question is, I think, the second half of your question, which is why we don't react to these low probability but very high impact, high risk events. There seems to be something about the sort of war game scenarios, the sort of dry paper based reports that people find really difficult to react to. I think in social science, people sometimes talk about them as not having the sort of proximity bias. So we, we, we only really think about things when they're absolutely staring us in the face. And so we have to find a way, I think, of thinking about the future and what's on the horizon that just feels more real and actually take the lessons, I think, from what's happened now, thinking about what that means for the way in which we replenish our basic research foundation activities, you know, whether it's the new Endless Frontier Act, new you know, European Innovation Council, so that we have the wellspring of innovation, so that we're again ready to prepare, so that even if we do have this slow and sort of rather stumbling ability to actually act in the short term, we at least have those R&D wellsprings that we can draw on and we have the entrepreneurial community. But I think that there's more that we need to do to actually come together to understand why we didn't respond this time. Because I'm not sure we've yet analyzed exactly why we didn't respond to the knowable so that we can then do better in the future. Does anybody else want to, um, to, to jump maybe, in? Maybe, yeah, maybe I can jump in. Um, so through through my work at BioBot now, I've been working in the public health space for the past few years. And something that I've noticed is that, you know, number one, we need to assume that there's going to be more outbreaks, either infectious disease or new substances, new, new drugs. Um, public health is a very dynamic field where I think like predicting exactly that a coronavirus was going to emerge in 2020, I think it's pretty difficult, but we can assume that those events where uh, an infectious agent jumps out of the anim another animal into humans is going to be, it's going to continue happening. It's just part of uh, how the world is running right now at very high density, uh, people being in contact with wildlife uh, as never before. So these events that we consider rare um, actually are going to keep happening. And the question is, how can the world be more aware about these possibilities and prepare globally? Uh, for example, from the data perspective, if we already had in place uh, a wastewater testing surveillance network like in the country, we could have started testing for the coronavirus in January when the first reports from China started coming out. We could have been so good at detecting where it arrived into our country and taking proper measures in those areas instead of letting it propagate and reach the point where we need to lock down an entire economy to deal with it. And I think like going forward, that's what, how we need to think about it is what data can we be gathering proactively to react quickly and not let these new events, these new outbreaks reach that epidemic status? I think that that should be 
kind of a goal um, that can help us react better when this happens again. And technical, do like when you test water, are you testing for coronavirus or testing for coronavirus and a thousand other things? And if there were a report tomorrow about a new kind of coronavirus spreading in Zambia, would you be able to start testing for it in all the places that send you water? Exactly. Um, so we look for, at this moment, you know, we're looking for SARS-CoV-2, but we've also developed already all of the technology to look at 20 different types of opioids, to look at cannabis, cocaine, meth, nicotine, you can look at antibiotic resistance, contaminants, food contaminants, information about diet. Basically, anything that passes through our body will most likely come out um, in, in the waste and is therefore a mirror of what's happening, of what we're experiencing as people. Very powerful. And it's funny that you mentioned this because actually many of our customers are asking us to also start creating the opioid data. Because right now, everybody is focused on COVID-19. What's happening with the opioid epidemic in the US, which had been up until recently, up until a few months ago, the main driver of morbidity, mortality in the country. So what's happening? Are people missing on their medications? Are people using more? Uh, you know, there's reason to believe that it's going to flare back up uh, with increased unemployment, decreased access to healthcare. So that's another advantage of looking at systems that let you collect all the different types of public health data and not just one type. Wonderful. All right, we have one last question. This is a fabulous question from Tom Weiler um, for the group. Are the panelists concerned that broader geopolitical tensions will make scientific and tech collaboration harder? Assuming that's a shared concern, how do we navigate these currents? We only have two minutes, so maybe one person jump in and respond to this. It's a great question. Thank you, Tom. I'll just jump in for one second. Uh, one of the really amazing things about a crisis is that people, we just have seen people from every institution, entrepreneurs, philanthropists, just jump on big problems together. And at the end of every conversation is like, wow, why don't we do this all the time? And so, you know, these are, are, are starting new neural pathways for all of us to say, like, maybe this is a better way to innovate is, you know, very short time pressured pushes where it's deep collaboration. So I, I don't see the world collaborating less because of this. My personal yeah. opinion. Will the world uh, collaborate less? Yeah, so I'd say two, two comments. One is I agree with Katie. I think overall the net is more collaboration. Specifically, the question I am worried that uh, the geopolitical tensions between the U.S. and China have significantly impeded our abilities to work with China from a scientific and tech standpoint, and I don't see that getting better. Let me add to it on a very positive note, speaking to your earlier comment about being reactive going forward. I hope that this pandemic will serve very positively to motivate young people to consider entering areas of work focused on infectious diseases. The young hotshots, as Katie can attest, who join MIT, who want to study life sciences, want to go after oncology and neuroscience, two very important areas. But I hope to see infectious disease grab that as a third area. And we need more talent to address the next pandemic, which easy prediction to make is coming. Well, well that is a perfect- Add to that for one second, Nick, I know we're gonna go over. <laughs> but, um, I think one of the most incredible things, if you look at what's happened for young people during this, they have started making things, they've realized that their hands matter and their brains matter, that the grownups don't know how to fix this and it's on them. And I think that is that is gonna um, be incredible for you know bearing a whole generation that thinks more about science and engineering and I think that's gonna be really cool. All right, well, that is a perfect note because as we speak, my three little children are making masks and working with their hands to try to counter the epidemic. So thank you very much to Katie, Fiona, Marianne, and Jim. Thank you to James for organizing it. Thank you to everybody who watched. I was astonished that nobody, literally nobody, dropped off the total numbers of viewers as this went on, which is a sign of a fabulous panel. Thank you all, I learned a lot in it. Have a good day. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone.
joining. Uh, a recording of this will be made available and uh, further information on the engine uh, and all the questions that have been discussed today, I can send it all out. Thanks so much to everyone. Take care. Thanks. Thank you.